Hello and welcome to another episode of the Strikecast. Nards, how are you? How are you after we've last chatted? There's been a lot of ups and downs, mostly downs, but 2-2 against Atalanta. What's your initial take on, on, on that result and performance? I mean, like you say, it's uh, good to be back. Um, but yeah, it's, there's a lot's happened since uh, since we've last uh, had a chat. So uh, last night, I think, I, I still want to go into those games, winning those games, but but you know when you when you get a goal like that towards the end of the game you can't help but celebrate can you and, and and you know think get in it's we've got a point the point i suppose was a fair result it's what we needed it puts us still top of the group uh, with a with a home win uh, in the next game and then we'll we'll, we'll qualify as as, as well, hopefully as winners so it, it wasn't the best of games i wasn't that impressed with the way we played but when you score a goal like that in the last minute and, and obviously Ronnie did it for us again it's it's always nice you say when you score a goal like that in, in, at the very end, you can't help but celebrate. But there was a certain Paul Scholes who, who didn't. And um, BT Sports showed after the game how, how the studio reacted to Ronaldo's equalising goal. And yet again, he does this in Europe. It's the biggest stage. He scored late goals against Villarreal, against Atalanta in the reverse fixture as well. Ronaldo's incredible form and people are trying to make out that he's been the problem this season. Those people seem forgetful that problems existed last season and we went into the transfer window and we didn't sign a central midfielder and everyone was calling out for one. Everyone understood that the priority was the centre back and they got Varane. It's been unfortunate that he's been picking up injuries. Mm. But Scholes didn't celebrate that goal, Nards. And I wanted to ask you about that because my initial take, and I got some flack on Twitter for this, was... It's weird that he's not celebrating a big United goal like that. It was a, a big point to get away from home. You mentioned that you want to be winning these games, but you you take these points. No, I mean, for, uh, just to come back on one point you made, anyone that was blaming Ronaldo in the last few weeks for the position Man United are a clueless and, and, and shouldn't be a fan of the club, and most likely aren't a fan of the club. But yeah, in terms of Paul Scholes, uh, it was strange. It is. It was a strange one. Um, you do think... As a United fan, whether you're a past player, current player, or just you know the average armchair fan, you'd, you'd be you'd be happy with a with a goal like that because it was a great finish and you know the way it was done and the fact that we 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 needed at least a point really to to you know to stay top of the of, of the group. It was a strange reaction, but then we've also got to take into consideration it's actually Paul Scholes and Paul Scholes would not be happy with the draw there. The likes of Roy Keane back in the day, you know, when they, if Paul Scholes, Roy Keane, the, the gig Nevilles, the gigs, you know, they wouldn't have been happy with that result going to that game uh, and getting a point. But it is still a bit strange that, you know, as, as a fan, and you know, he's a fan that he didn't celebrate the goal, but it, it's a tricky one. I do think he loves the club, but I just, I just think it's, like he said, it's papering over the cracks. I actually think it's deeper than that with schools because the game against Liverpool, and I haven't even properly spoken on the podcast since then, mm. um, it, it made the manager's job untenable. Um, not from the point of view that the fans shouldn't get behind the team, shouldn't get behind the manager or sing his name, he's still a legend in the club. But that result made his job untenable. It raised big questions. And Paul Scholes is someone that I think, for the most part, has been understanding of, of the way Solskjaer has done things. I think for the most part, there's been, he's raised questions this, this season. And, and in the reverse game against Atalanta, if you remember, he actually he came out afterwards. And even though it was a big 3-2 comeback, he was pretty flat afterwards and was warning that... If they don't shape up, they play the same way in the first half against Liverpool, they'll get hammered. We got humiliated. And he was right. And he yeah. issued a similar warning last night about the performance that he, that he wasn't happy. I, but I think ultimately his demeanour on, 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 on BT was telling. I think it was the demeanour of someone who is fed up of what they're watching every week. Now, that doesn't... It, it, it's interesting because we've such a big fan base, Manchester United. You have so many people, and we've we've we, we've spoken about how social media has been, you know, all out for, for for some time, and we've been, you know, disagreeing with those people. Not disagreeing, but disagreeing with the way they they go about it. Disagree with the way they show a lack of respect. But there's still fans, nards, that are at games. There's still fans that are singing his name, singing songs, and getting behind the team. But 
you look at Spurs and they've sacked Nuno after 17, 18 matches. Is that something that you're proud of as a Manchester United fan, that we have that kind of defiant streak about our, our, our nature as supporters? Yeah, to answer it simply, yes, I think it's fantastic that the fan base, I mean, we saw a lot of fans leave after Liverpool halfway through the game. We saw yeah. a lot, of, but there were still fans at the end there. And as you know, sitting in that in the stretchy end, it's there were still fans there clapping him, singing his name, singing for the lads, still supporting the team no matter what. And that's what I, I, I hesitate in saying a proper fan or a true fan because they are because everyone re- responds differently to different things. But they're not these um, these keyboard warriors, are they? That's on Twitter and, and different platforms and slating the manager. They're they're going to support the club through through and through, which fans should do. There are going to be sections of the support that don't want Ollie in. There's going to be sections of support they're going to support him through thick and thin but but ultimately it's got to be done in the right way um but yeah it does it does make you proud because you know it's a huge club he's got a huge fan base he's got some fantastic fans and uh, but likewise there's some idiots and we all see them on on social media more than not with with, with the with the language the way they go about speaking about ollie who is a club legend and, and it's how they handle certain situations but football's a game of opinions and people are entitled to their opinions it's just about how they go about their opinions and, and, and how they put it across ultimately it's up to you who you want to have those opinions with that's something that i've kind of I've learned over, over recent weeks the volume of messages coming in about Soul Jar and there's only so so much time you can dedicate to to replying on social media because you have your own life as well um, and producing this podcast and and, and, and the blog you know we're, we're kept going and it's been a busy period I, I suspect don't want to spend too much time on on Soul Jar, but I suspect that over the international break there will be a lot of talk we have the the Manchester Derby which we're going to get into shortly and, and and that game is ultimately going to be the big, big one for, for the manager in, in this three-game spell that he was given to salvage his job. But mm-hmm. going back on last night, we've seen a, a repeat of the, what I call a, a 5-3-2 formation against Atalanta from the start, like we've seen against Spurs in the 3-0 win. And it was convincing against Spurs because it was rare this season to see that Manchester United actually appear to have a midfield. We had control over the game and it allowed then our, our wing backs to kind of a bit, bit more freedom. Shaw didn't play particularly well, but he didn't do really bad because yeah. there, there, there was assurances there. Varane was organising at the back. But Juan Bissaka was a surprise at, foot, at wing back because he would have been the, the player that I would have been questioning in that formation. But he, he played pretty well against Spurs. Now, last night there wasn't that assurances in midfield. There wasn't that control. Is that a worry? I was surprised in the formation. I know it was a successful over the weekend against Spurs, but I was surprised that he kept that formation going into a game against Atalanta. I thought he'd go back to, to type and, and, and go with his back four. It is worrying because every game... St- I go into every game now, not convinced that we're going to win. Knowing that we should probably win with the talent we've got and the players that we have, but not convinced we're going to win. And, and even last night, although I say we should win and we should go to places like that and inspect the win, you're still not confident going into the game like that. And I wasn't against Spurs at the weekend. And to me, it's too choppy change at the moment with three of the back then changing it to five of the back or or when Brian got injured, then going back to, you know, a back four. It's like, it's, 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 it's coming back to the point of what is our style of play? What's our philosophy? How are we going about these games? It's, it's confusing as a fan who watch, I mean, watch every single game. So we don't know from one minute to the next how we're going to play or what style of football we're going to play, whether it's pressing, whether it's sitting back on the counter-attack. It's, it's just confusing. And, and yeah, it is worrying because all the top clubs in, in Europe, they dominate the midfield uh, position. You can't pick and choose the games that you, you dominate. Well, the main benefit too of having a style of play and the trust of the board as well, because I'm going to go back to Liverpool last season when Jorgen Klopp had a number of injuries to his defence and across midfield, he had to bring Fabinho back and he had to play young players in midfield as a result but he still stuck to his system he still stuck to his style of play because that's in the long term that's what he wants to these players to be able to play with and even though it wasn't working and even though results were patchy for for, for them last season even though they were reigning champions despite that pack results were very patchy and it was a poor defense of a title but he stuck with it because he had that style of play. I don't think Solskjaer has that at all. And it's been a criticism that's been levelled at him for, for some time. 
I don't think he's one of those managers. Um, I think he's been a manager who's come in, who has did a really good job of getting the dressing room back on side uh, and, and players respect and, and like playing for him. And, and, and I think that shows in performances. It shows that you know they haven't got that style. It shows that they're reliant on individual brilliance. In games look p- people kind of say you know that result last night it papers over the cracks it, it pretty much a lot of our wins this season have seemed like that but how long does that continue before that it's not papering over cracks that's just the way we play under soul Sharon. and that it's a bit crazy because like for instance off the ball a popular radio station here in ireland they uploaded a podcast last night after the game and they it was like it they were speaking live as the game was going on and in the 50th minute or so, the guy that was hosting the show said, like, we all know what's going to happen here. Yeah. Or sorry, after Atlanta went 2-1 ahead, he said, we all know what's going to happen here. Ronaldo's going to score an equaliser in the 90th minute, and United <laughs> are probably going to go on to win the game. And it didn't quite happen like that, but h- how long, now is this just papering over the cracks, or is this part of the way we play? We haven't got a style, but it's just barbaric. Well, just to touch back on a couple of the points you made there, I think you mentioned Liverpool, you can talk about Chelsea, you can talk about City, you can talk about all these teams that even if they have got injuries to the squad and they bring certain players in, whether it's young players or players filling in a gap, they still know their job and what they're, what the manager expects of them. And I don't think some of our players know in certain situations what they're meant to be doing or what the manager expects of them. Of course, they know how to play football, they want to play, but they might not. I mean, Cop has specifics that he wants his players to do and they must be in this position, that position. Pep's the master of it, unfortunately. He knows he wants his players here in this position, this position, no matter depending on where the ball is on the pitch. They know what they're doing. They, they, there's no hiding place. They know their job. And I don't think some of our players do. So papering over the cracks... It's not like we're a, a Leeds, a West Ham, a club that, you know, they're, they're a you know, half-decent premiership club with half-decent premiership players. This is Manchester United with some of the best players in the world. Let's not, let's not like, flutter over that. We have got mm. some of the best players in the world. There's no doubt in my mind. Multi-million pound players that we paid fortunes for or have come up through the ranks who are, who are world beaters. So you can't go through a season with the players we have papering over the cracks, a last minute penalty save from De Gea, West Ham, losses to, to battered off Liverpool, losses to Villa, home games that we, 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 we've, we've lost. It, it, you can't paper over the cracks when you've got a squad we've got. There's got to be expectancy level to be competing for the Premier League, to be competing for titles, trophies, European championships, whatever you want it to be. United can't afford to paper over the cracks with the with the money we've spent and the players we've got. So at some point, there's got to be a philosophy, a style of play. The players got to know what's expected of them. And if they're not doing it, like a couple of players are, at the moment don't seem to be doing it or putting putting in the work, even uh, then then they're out of the team. So you need you need a bit of ruthlessness at the top as well. What I wanted to ask on that was, can Ali trust his eleven? Because we've seen against Spurs, he kind of went with an experienced front two. He had Fernandez in there, Fred and McTominay, and he kept it compact and with his trusted kind of defenders as well, with Varane in there, who never gets dropped regardless of performances. Is that one of his faults that he can't trust his 11? Because is that where the cons- inconsistency comes from? That we can't get a run of good performances together because you don't know who's going to perform from one week to the other. McTominay is one of them this season. It's been very inconsistent. One week he looks really, against Spurs, for instance, man of the match. Soldier spoke about him afterwards. He, he led everything from midfield. But against Liverpool, I know that's a bad day for everyone. And even yeah. other games this season, he has looked cowardly. This is a point now of the season where you're looking at players and who's standing up and who Soldier can trust. And I don't see 11 every week. There isn't 11 every week. The results shows that. The, the last minute equalisers or, you know, coming from 2-0 down to get wins or, or the, 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 the players aren't showing up every week. But I think a couple of players you could say they don't put the effort in at times or they look lackadaisical and they look like they can't be bothered. I think you could definitely say that about a couple of players at times. I think some players... Who, 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 can, who can you say most weeks is putting it in? Bruno, left, right and centre, running, running around everywhere. He, he he works his nuts off, but he does it sometimes and it's frustrating because then no one else backs him up. So it's got to, and it comes back to the philosophy, the style of play, whether you're pressing or you're not pressing. If if one goes, three or four behind him have got to go as well. You can't have one player just running around like a blue-ass mm. fly. 
because it doesn't work. I mean, I learned that from playing in League Two, League One and Championship level, let alone at the top level. And these are going to be the best players, best managers in the world. So there's got to be a game plan for each and every game. And, and I don't think the players are, I just think they're confused from one game to the next in, in yeah. different situations. In different. I genuinely do because there is a lack of philosophy, a lack of style of play uh, and, and almost a lack of leadership. I, I, I think a lot of the unrest then from players, because the, the Athletic claim a small group of United players have had enough of the manager. There is a small group that have thrown the towel in pretty much. Um, we mm. can guess who that is, probably Danny Van Der Beek, who's not getting much game time. Um, but it definitely isn't Harry Maguire or Fred or McTominay. Um, <laughs> with that, look, we've always said that the players have enjoyed playing under him. They've always appreciated him and the way that he goes about his job. That's probably not going to get us to the next step when we're talking about styles of play and, and, and we're talking about these brilliant players looking confused because ultimately that's one of his biggest shortcomings right now. We go into the game against City, we are unsure or we are not unsure, he can't trust his, his 11 every week. And you can't, you don't, you don't say that about the top managers who have a style because yeah. those players have bought into the style. A lot of those players are at those clubs because of that style. You yeah. look at Jorgen Klopp, Thomas Tuchel, Pep Guardiola, and you mentioned as well, you know how they're going to play going into these games. So their fans are not puzzled or, or, or hoping that the players rise to the occasion. They know what they're going to get. They know yeah. what they're going to get. You see it, you see it with, with lesser teams as well. You, I mean, look at Brighton this year, look at West Ham. The, man, the, 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 the players there, the team, they, they sign players to, to fit the style. The, the, the managers are ruthless in certain situations and, and, and they know what's expected of them. And, and that's why these clubs are, are, are outperforming almost this season, which is why it's so frustrating when I feel we'll see us underperforming because we have got just an abundance of talent all over the pitch and even on the bench I feel sorry I still I know to bring I feel sorry for Lingard van der Beek because though those players or especially Lingard he was he was on top form he was, on, he was our best player a, a few well six weeks ago and then he, he hasn't played a game since so it's frustrating knowing that there's players on the bench as well that haven't even been given the chance when we've been playing so poorly or even Jaden Sancho given that he's a new sign he costs significantly more in the in the 70 million regions and this season has been, you know, shot of any really chances. He came on last night and I thought he looked good. He gave us a bit of energy when we, we had the option of having five subs in the Champions League. So much mm-hmm. about Van de Beek and, and Sancho with less than 10 minutes left. But Sancho nearly got uh, an assist for Van de Beek in injury time to win the game. As well as that, Van de Beek played a role in Ronaldo's equaliser. So, yeah. you know, it was a positive from that. Another positive I want to bring up is Eric Bale's <laughs> performance because he, he played a, a role in Atalanta's second goal. But he was amazing last night, I still felt. Because it looked at times when Varane went off injured that it was a one-man defence. Because it's Harry Maguire, who we have to get on with, get on to, um, was all over the place. But Bali. Yeah. There was one moment in which at the, at the start of the second half, he just looks up towards the Atalanta Ultras and smiles, a cheeky grin. Because <laughs> it just sums up the kind of player he is because he's, he's, yeah. he's crazy. Um, but, but last night was one of his better performances, Nards. And, but what does that tell you about the kind of player he is? Have you played with anyone like this who can, say, not play regularly, hasn't made an appearance in September, but comes in and is just a freak. Now, yeah. and also a freak at, at, at the level that can do it like that one week and then can go rock bottom for four. Well, yeah, I think, he, I, well, I agree with you to start with. He was phenomenal last night. Best player for, for United by, by a long way. He, he's come in. He's, I think he's stressed recently that he doesn't want to leave the club, hasn't he? I, might, I don't think I've got that wrong. Um, and I think, I think he, he, his agent is quite <clears throat> melty in a sense that when he's not getting game time, he's, he's vocal about it. <laughs> OK, OK. So, listen, he's a winner. He wants to win. He, he wants to play. He, and he puts 
he's all in. I've never. I've, he's not. He's not one of the players that I'd say is lazy or doesn't put the effort in or doesn't compete in games. At times, he might be a bit rash, and he might be. You know, he might be a bit nervous. You know, when he's going into a tackle and stuff like that. But but he's all or nothing, isn't he? And and, and yeah, I've come across players that in, in, that you know can can just turn it on at any given stage. And last night, <clears throat> he was he was phenomenal, but. When a player plays like that, you've got to keep him in the team. And I'm not confident when all players are fit or if Lindelof's fit this weekend, he's going to be back in the team. So it's it's a strange one. Um, but I've always liked him and I think he deserves a chance. And especially with Maguire's form at the moment, it's, 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 it, Maguire will play, but most people would say that he probably should get get his confidence back, get back up to fitness and, and you know, start to, you know, almost earn his place in the team because we all know he's good enough. He, he's been phenomenal the last couple of years for United, but his current form isn't fantastic, is it, let's, to, 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 to say the least. I know some managers will choose to play a, a player who's out of form throughout that spell and, and they'll stick by him because they believe that that's how they'll come out of it by playing football. Harry Maguire is one that I think really people need to start raising questions over. I said it last season, very critical of him. He had a good Euros and suddenly I thought with Frank coming in, right, we could have a real pair in. I think ultimately as well, Harry Maguire really needs to run against beside um, Varane, I think ultimately for himself. But that doesn't seem going to be the case because Varane is now injured with a hamstring injury. So he could be out of the game against City. But Maguire has been shocking. Really, really, really bad. Really bad. And, and, and Solskjaer has continued to play him. But I'm pretty sure any of the other top teams, you look at even City, you look at the Port, and they're, they're winning games. He takes those defenders out of games. I know he can, but Solskjaer has a, has a number of defenders. Bali is someone who hasn't played since September. And he comes in last night and puts in a performance like that. With, with, with Harry, Harry Maguire, the past boy, we probably could have done with Eric Bali. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. I think you get a perfect example. Pep drops them all the time, doesn't he? Or changes them, switches them in and out all the time. So I understand you want to play your captain and you, what you, your main man and players have trust, uh, managers have trust in players. And there's certain players that are going to play most games, but you've got to be clever as a manager. And if players are on form and performing well, you, you play them, don't you? And if players are struggling, you explain to them behind closed doors that, look, couple of poor performances. You're going to be back in the team within in a couple of weeks. But I'm going to go with so-and-so this week. And, and the players will respect that and do that. Just be honest about it. And it seems to me that <clears throat> he'll drop certain players who haven't been performing or not even play certain players that he feels aren't performing and yet can, you know, can consistently pick players that have been poor or shocking, <laughs> to, to put it your way. Yeah, no, I, I think so. And some players have, and I think that shows a weakness. You know, at, at the, in the modern game and the standard of coaches, if a player is not playing well, you've got to be bigger. Because ultimately, the, we all fascinate about a long-term view. That's what we want. But ultimately, the game can move very quickly. And you're, 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 you're I, I guess, you're... Um, loyalty to certain players can be your biggest downfall because you haven't got much time. And, and, and I think it's, it's time for big decisions with Solskjaer. We're going to move on to the, the Manchester Derby preview quickly before we wrap it up. Um, Nards, what have your friends been telling you in Manchester about, about this game, your, your city, your blue friends, your brother? Is your brother a blue? No, no, it's um, I've got a couple of friends, family members as well that are, that are Man City fans. So I think they're they're, they're confident. I mean, okay. why wouldn't they, why wouldn't they be? Um, it's almost a shame. It's almost a shame we're not playing away. It's, it's a home, it's home, isn't it? It's it's home. Yeah, yeah, it's almost, yeah. We, we seem to do better away, don't we? When we got um, when we play City, so it's almost a shame we're not there because I fancy us a bit more. But yeah, the, the City fans I know are very confident. Um, even more so now if Iran is out because you know he 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 brings that calm to the defence as as we can all see. Um, but it, it, listen, anything can happen in a derby. But we said the same against Liverpool, didn't we? So again, I'm going to go into this game cautiously optimistic without much confidence, um, but hoping that we can we can nick something. Look, there's no denying that if City really turn it on, 
and, and to get an early goal, like I'd be fearing the worst because it could be another <laughs> cricket scoreline. And uh, that's exactly what Solskjaer does not need because he goes into this job with his, his, his job, I feel, untenable. Um, mm. And I think the club will have a, have a decision to make if he loses that game and because it will completely um, throw us out of the title race very early on. Expectations will be shot um, before even Christmas, and, 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 and that's big. And they will have to make a decision then if he loses this game. But City, from the City fans I've spoken to, a lot aren't very happy with Kevin De Bruyne this season, feel he's underperformed. Um, I think that could come into our, our favour. I think looking at this, the City team going into this season, I question how they didn't have a centre forward, how they didn't replace Kevin or Conaguero. Yeah. Um, and and it, they've, they've needed a centre forward for, for two or three years, I could be mistaken. So it's it, it's really a surprise that they left Aguero go this year, knew that was happening and, and spent all summer kind of waiting on Harry Kane when, when, when they knew Daniel Levy wasn't going to budge. Um, so that, that was strange. And they didn't get the criticism that would have been the case had that been Manchester United, by the way, because we would have all known about it. Um, mm. So that's the big difference. But yeah, look, I, am, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic. I wasn't optimistic naively before the Liverpool game. Um, I, I looked at her performances they weren't good enough you look at Liverpool you look at City and I mentioned Chelsea in that bracket a number of times in this podcast they're all playing really really well um, City have their games without a centre forward where they, they, they need one where they're not putting away chances they have Grealish and Dagen and a number of creative players that can put it on a plate but they yeah. haven't been able to execute it every week and I think that could be their their downfall if this turns into a title race. If this turns into a three-way title race, that could be one of the fine margins that, that hits City in the long run, um, not having that centre forward. So it'll be interesting to, see if to go out and address that in January. But for the weekend, I'm going to predict a one-all draw. <laughs> Nards, it, it, where are you going with? It, it, it's funny because you, you um, in all, like, like you said, like you weren't, you weren't, you weren't confident going into the Liverpool game. As soon as I saw the, the starting team was exactly the same as the Atlanta team, I said to I said to my brother-in-law and my father-in-law, we, "We're going to get B here three 0 Simply on the team selection, knowing and, and knowing how we performed, the, the, I would have taken know. that. <laughs> yeah, would have taken that. So I, I'll, I'll stick. I'll go with you. I'll say a one-all draw, but that could easily change depending on the team selection and the style of play that Ollie decides to go with on on, on the weekend. So. I'll take a draw all day long. If 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 they give us a one one draw now, I'll snap their hands off. What I need to do as well before we wrap it up is I've promised to ask a few questions from the Facebook page. Right, here are the questions from Nick Rolls. Are we over reliant on Ronaldo? Is he disrupting the balance of the team? Well, yes, we are definitely over reliant on Ronaldo because he's he's the only one that seems to be putting the ball in the back of the net in, in crucial times. And there's plenty of talent around him, Bruno, Greenwood, Sancho. There's players there that just need to, to be given opportunities and, you know, and, and perform. But but no, he's not disrupting the team. I, I think anyone who thinks that... Trick also, question, Nards, by the way. Name a team in the last 20 years that weren't reliant on Ronaldo. <laughs> exactly. It's a very good point. <laughs> Damien Young asks... How to solve a problem called Maguire. Club captain and playing terribly. Can Oli be brave enough to drop him? Two steps up and takes over the captaincy. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, yes, he could be dropped. A lot we we discussed earlier. It's it's just about the manager being a bit more ruthless, knowing that he's not the informed defender um, and play the guys that are playing well. It makes it a bit more difficult with the injuries we have now. So I'm not convinced he will be dropped. But yes, it can be done. Um, and just give him give him a bit of time to get back to fitness and get his confidence back. Um, what, what was the other question? Who steps up and takes over the captaincy? I, look, I don't think that is on the agenda. Solskjaer will not strip him up the captaincy. No. That's one of his decisions. But if Solskjaer is replaced as manager, then that's probably going to be up in the air, I would say. Mm-hmm. Manchester United know this too. You give someone else this job, they're going to want to come in and sign their own players too. They would have this kind of idea that they have a plan in place and that every manager will come in and be part of it. No, it's not how football works. And Antonio Conte wouldn't have worked that way. So there will yeah. be players that will be sweating if Solskjaer is sacked over the international break. But look, that's, we haven't got there just yet. 
hoping for a good result at the weekend. The Manchester United come out with three points and gets the season back on track. And Solskjaer can salvage his job. That's a positive. That's a good thing. Absolutely. 